Um, I introduced Dr. Phillips last night, but um, just really briefly, uh, Dr. Phillips is a um, holder of advanced degrees from Catholic University in medieval studies and early Christian studies. He also has a Master's of Divinity from Concordia Fort Wayne. He's currently the pastor of Concordia Lutheran Church in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, so with that, I'd like to go ahead and give it to uh, Dr. Phillips. And thank you. Thanks. All right, so part two. Um, it wasn't actually designed to be part two, but there are definite connections and relations, as you will see as we go forward. I hope you like my whimsical skilla. Not that it's mine, but I picked it myself out of Google Images. <laughs> skilla and Charybdis, steering a course between Mani and Pelagius. To uh, refresh your memory, we have a little bit from the Odyssey. Odysseus is on his way home from the Trojan Wars and he's got to deal with all kinds of uh, trials and dangers along the way. And one of them is a nautical danger. Going through a strait, there are dangers on one side and on the other side and a very narrow course to steer between them. And so this has come into the language, um, the Scylla and Charybdis, or the Scylla and Charybdis, it's in a police song, the song uh, wrapped around your finger, right? Trapped between the Scylla and Charybdis. Uh, usually means uh, something where you have to walk a tightrope in order not to fall, in order not to have something bad happen to you. Uh, something that I didn't remember until I revisited the actual um, story was that the way it's set up in the Odyssey, it's actually impossible to get by unscathed. <laughs> so this is the advice that Odysseus receives from the goddess Circe before he uh, encounters this uh, trial. The other cliff that will note Odysseus is lower. They are close to each other. Thou couldst even shoot an arrow across, and on it is a great fig tree with rich foliage. But beneath this, Divine Charybdis, the whirlpool, sucks down the black water. Thrice a day she belches it forth, and thrice she sucks it down terribly. Mayest thou not be there when she sucks it down, for no one could save thee from ruin, no, not the earth shaker. Which uh, would be Poseidon, I think. Nay, draw very close to Scylla's cliff, and drive thy ship past quickly, for it is better far to mourn six comrades in thy ship than all together. Why six comrades? Count the heads. Skill is going to get a shot at you, but you get um, you lose six shipmates in that way instead of actually driving into the whirlpool and losing everything. So now this is the account of the actual passage. We look towards her, that is towards Charybdis, and feared destruction. But meanwhile, Scylla seized from out the hollow ship six of my comrades who were the best in strength and in might. Turning my eyes to the swift ship and to the company of my men, even then I noted above me their feet and hands as they were raised aloft. To me they cried aloud, calling upon me by name for that last time in anguish of heart. And as a fisher on a jutting rock, when he casts in his baits as a snare to the little fishes, with his long pole lets down into the sea the horn of an ox of the steading, and then as he catches a fish, flings it ring, writhing ashore, even so they were drawn writhing up toward the cliffs. Then at her door she devoured them, shrieking and stretching out their hands toward me in their awful death struggle. Most piteous did mine eyes behold that thing of all that I bore while I explored the paths of the sea. Now this was the worst thing he saw in all of his adventures, was these six men who could not be saved, um, devoured by Scylla, basically as the uh, toll for their passage. So, which one is Mani and which one is Pelagius? Uh, are you, is it the one that you steer towards or the one you steer away from? Which is the one that is the greater danger? Let us investigate. Mani lived third century AD. He was Persian. He grew up in a Gnostic Ebionite sect. The Ebionites were uh, Judaizers originally, but some of them were also Gnostics. And uh, there were communities of them throughout the uh, 
throughout the Roman world and also into Persia because there had been communities of Jews throughout the Roman world and also into Persia. And uh, so Mani grew up with one of these sects, uh, kind of related to, uh, there's a sect still surviving today, the Marsh Arabs in Iraq. They were uh, persecuted by Saddam Hussein. Uh, they are survivals of a, of a group called the Mandeans, which were a group similar to what Mani was. And so that's a survival to this day of a group similar to where he came from. But he didn't stay there. He had visions. He traveled to India and studied Hinduism and Buddhism. Then he returned to Persia and joined the Shah's court and tried unsuccessfully to convert him from Zoroastrianism, which is the other big religious influence. Mani's a soup of religious influences because Zoroastrianism was the religion of the Persian Empire. A later Shah persecuted the Manichaeans, and Mani either died in prison or was flayed alive. I know which one I would choose, um, but the sources, are, uh, the sources disagree about whether he died in prison while he was awaiting execution, and then his body was flayed and stuffed with grass, uh, his skin stuffed with grass, or whether it happened actually while he was still living. Eusebius, in his uh, famous History of the Church, this is, this is the entirety of what he says about Mani. And if you read it, you realize, hey, I didn't take the hyperlinks off, oh well. If you read it, uh, you'll see that he didn't get a very serious treatment from Eusebius. At this time, the madman, named from his demoniacal heresy, okay, Manes is his name, and uh, Eusebius is a Greek speaker, so he's thinking of the Greek word mania and related words, uh, which, you know, it's a pun that works in Latin too, but of course, Mani wasn't, you know, Mani was Persian, so that's not with his name meant in his language, but Eusebius isn't going to let this pass without using it. Armed himself in the perversion of his reason. See, his whole name is being exegeted here to explain him. As the devil Satan, who himself fights against God, put him forward to the destruction of many. He was a barbarian in life, both in word and deed, and in his nature demoniacal and insane. Did I mention he was insane? <laughs> In consequence of this, he sought to pose as Christ, and being puffed up in his madness, he proclaimed himself the paraclete and the very Holy Spirit. And afterwards, like Christ, he chose 12 disciples as partners of his new doctrine. Okay, this part here actually is historical. Um, Jesus said he was going to send a paraclete, he was going to send a helper, and Manny said, hi, here I am. Uh, you know, I am, it's, it's basically exactly what Muhammad did a couple centuries later. I, I'm, the next, I'm the next prophet. I'm the one that all the others were preparing you for. I'm the big deal. And he had, yeah, 12 disciples. And he patched together false and godless doctrines collected from a multitude of long extinct impieties and swept them like a deadly poison from Persia to our part of the world. From him, the impious name of the Manichaeans is still prevalent among many. Eusebius is writing early 4th century. From him, the impious, oh yeah, such was the foundation of this knowledge, falsely so called, which sprang up in these times. So this is a quotation from St. Paul, the knowledge that was falsely so called, and it was used specifically to uh, talk about Gnosticism in the early church, because the Gnostics, they got their name from Gnosis, the word for wisdom or knowledge, and um, so was, this is a false Gnosis. And Manichaeism is, at its root, a kind of, you know, a kind of Gnosticism. It's a mashup of Gnostic Christianity, Zoroastrianism, and Buddhism. Which means it's really, really dualistic, because all of those things are dualistic. Um, in Gnosticism, you get the idea that the, uh, that the physical world is created not by God proper, but by a demigod who went wrong. Um, and spirit is created by God. In Zoroastrianism, you also have a totally dualistic system uh, light and darkness as equal, eternal principles um, striving against each other. And uh, Buddhism, you have at least the, the dualism between uh, what, what's real, which is basically intellectual, and what's apparent, which is the physical world that you see. And walking the true path is the path of uh, asceticism and keeping, um, keeping your eyes on the intellectual prize and uh, not being distracted by the appearances of this world. Depending which Manichaean tradition you pay attention to, grr, Mani was the reincarnation of Buddha, or Krishna, or Zoroaster, or Jesus. Take your pick. This unabashed syncretism allowed Manichaeanism to spread and flourish in different local variations over a large swath of the world, at one time or another from Western Europe all the way to China. 
and China was actually where it survived the longest. This also meant that the Manichees were widely persecuted throughout their history. And uh, not to tip my hand at all, but um, this is bad stuff, right? This, this is not even Christian. And it was never mistaken for being Christian. Um, unlike Gnosticism, which uh, masqueraded as Christianity in the early centuries, and actually in the first and second century wasn't necessarily that easy to distinguish because the Gnostics used the same scriptures, they just interpreted them differently. And there were plenty of places where the local congregation was a mixture of Catholics and Gnostics. And, um, it only became like they only sifted out over time where you get these actually firm distinctions between uh, the Catholic faith and the Gnostic heresy. But Manichaeanism, by the time Mani comes on the scene, that distinction is clear. And then he goes and adds all this stuff from other religions that aren't even related to Christianity um, just, in case, just in case you missed it. Uh, th this is not Christianity at all and it was never mistaken for it. So, I mean, the whole, the whole faith is just overthrown if you go that way. Pelagius. Pelagius, uh, he was a little later than Mani. He flourished. Uh, we don't know his birth and death dates, but the, these were the years where he was really in the spotlight, 390 to 418. He was from the British Isles. Um, he became famous at Rome as a teacher and spiritual counselor um, to wealthy Christians. Uh, and he became very concerned with the state of morality in Christian society. And he began writing against Augustine, the Bishop of Hippo in North Africa, because he considered his teachings on grace to encourage moral laxity among Christians. Uh, he's like, uh, this is hard enough to try to inculcate virtue in all these people and get them to toe the line and, and obey the law without somebody respected like Augustine saying things like, my evil sorrows contend with my good joys, and on which side the victory may be, I know not. Woe is me. Lord, have pity on me. Woe is me. Lo, I hide not my wounds. You are the physician, I the sick. Thou merciful, I am miserable. Is not the life of man upon earth a temptation? Who is he that wishes for vexations and difficulties? Woe unto the adversities of this world once and again and for the third time from the desire of prosperity and because adversity itself is a hard thing and makes shipwreck of endurance. Is not the life of man upon earth a temptation and that without intermission? And my whole hope is only in your exceeding great mercy. Give what you command and command what you will. Thou imposest continency, continence, um, specifically sexual moderation. Thou imposest continence on us. Nevertheless, when I perceived, says one, that I could not otherwise obtain her except God gave her me, that was a point of wisdom also, to know whose gift she was. He's quoting from the book of wisdom. For by continency are we bound up and brought into one, whence we were scattered abroad into many. For he loves you too little, who loves anything with you, which he loves not for you. O love, who ever burnest and art never quenched. O charity, my God, kindle me. You command continency, Give what you command and command what you will. And Pelagius thought, man, that's just, that's just such a gaping loophole. You know, everybody that I'm uh, getting on and trying to, uh, trying to bust their chops and make them pay attention to the law of God and actually be good and be Christians, they can just quote Augustine here. They can just pray that prayer. I've been praying that prayer and he just hasn't given it to me yet. <laughs> What are you going to do? I, I can't help it. And so he started writing against Augustine. He said, you, you, know, you, can't, you can't take this fatalistic attitude toward it. You know, temptation is not this inescapable thing. Uh, temptation is not something that you have to, uh, that you have to fall into. Right? You, 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 can, you can get away from it if you work hard enough. You can get away from it. And you certainly can't just like, sit there and wait for God to give you the, uh, the power to do it. Or say, like, I haven't got this special grace, and that's why I haven't done it. So he, he was opposed to this whole idea of internal grace, this idea that God, could, um, that God would give you some power that would count as a virtue within you, or that he would put some power within you that would animate you to do virtue. He said he already did that when he created the world. 
He made the world good. God saw everything that he had made, and it was very good. You've already got that power. Just use it, you friggin' weakling. <laughs> um, so uh, that, was, that was Pelagius. He started taking that tack, and people started, like Augustine, started saying, you, you, what about the grace of God? Don't you need the grace of God to be good? And Pelagius said, yeah, the grace of creation. He already gave that grace when he created you, and then he gave us the law to remind us of that, and that was grace too. And then, you know, baptism, if, if, you, uh, if you have messed up, you can get baptized and you can have your sins washed away. But after baptism, you better be good. You know, the, these, are the, these are the forms in which God's grace comes. He didn't deny grace altogether, but he said it's, it's all external grace, uh, except for the grace of creation. So Pelagius, in 410, when the Goths sacked Rome, he fled Rome to Carthage, which is also in North Africa, not far from Hippo. And the next year, the 15th Council of Carthage, with Augustine playing a major role, condemned Pelagianism. Uh, Chilestius is a follower of Pelagius who stays in North Africa when it gets too hot for Pelagius, and he gets in further trouble in North Africa, sort of developing the ideas in a further, more systematic way. But Pelagius flees to Palestine, and in 415, a uh, synod in the region of Caesarea in Palestine actually exonerates, actually exonerates him of the charges that have been brought against him by some expat Western bishops who know Augustine. And so this, this causes a problem for Augustine, and he has to write a whole treatise about the Synod of Diospolis. He gets the minutes of the Synod, and he goes through them, and he recounts them, and he says, you know, see how Pelagius ducked the question here? See how he's, he's not really answering what they asked? He's taking advantage of the fact that they don't know the issues involved. He's taking advantage of these poor Eastern uh, clerics. And it's true that his accusers weren't actually at the Synod, and so they couldn't hold his feet to the fire and say, you know, that's an evasion, or, yeah, he hasn't really answered the question. In 418, Pope Zosimus condemned Pelagianism as a heresy, and the Emperor Honorius, who was the emperor in the West, exiled the Pelagians from the West. And so they went to the West, Scylestius, and Pelagius was already there, and Julian of Eclanum was the other big Pelagian. He was a bishop in Italy who was exiled, and he was the last big um, opponent that Augustine corresponded back and forth with. 431, and this is two years after Augustine dies, the Council of Ephesus, which was mostly convened to consider the Nestorian heresy, condemned also Pelagius and Chilestius by name. And uh, this was because they made a, they made a connection. Um, that they, basically, this is how the West got through to the East, that Pelagianism was a serious issue. Um, since they were talking about Nestorianism already, they suggested a connection between Pelagianism and Nestorianism that... Um, is expressed with uh, uh, the maxim, and I don't know whose quotation this is originally, that the uh, Pelagian, that the Nestorian Christ is the perfect savior for the Pelagian man. Uh, Nestorius, it, he says that uh, Jesus Christ was not God in the person, like he was, Jesus Christ was a man with God indwelling him, rather than sharing an identity of person. And so when Jesus does good things, it's not just, you know, it's not God, the God-man doing good things. It is a man, just like us, doing good things, aided by the power of God within him, of the divine logos within him. And so uh, one of the cornerstones of Pelagius' position was that it was actually possible to be perfect. It was possible to live a perfect life, even if not many people did it. And he went through the Old Testament, and basically anybody who was called righteous, he said, you know, Abel, Perfect life. You know, um, who are some of the other ones? I remember Abel specifically, but he had a short list from the Bible of people that he Enoch. said, no, was that? Enoch. Enoch, yeah, right. I mean, God, God took him, right, because he liked him so much. Um, so uh, basically, like, the Nestorianism establishes that at least in Jesus Christ, it was possible for a man to do exactly what Pelagius said it was possible for men to do. It's still not Pelagianism, though, because he had the internal help of the word indwelling him from his birth. Um, so this link between Pelagianism and Nestorianism doesn't work as well as, as the people who condemned Pelagius and the, as some of the people who condemned them thought it did. Um, but the fact remains, at least, you know, as a technicality even, that uh, Pelagius and Chilestius were condemned by the East as well as by the West, even though this was a specifically Western 
debate. He used to be a Manichae, right, and he didn't make any bones about it. It's, it's in the Confessions. He talks about it in the Confessions in detail about why he was a Manichae and how long he was a Manichae and what was the course of his conversion out of that. So Pelagius knows, Julian of Eclanum knows, and when they start having this debate about whether the human nature is good enough that people can just buckle down and be good and obey the law with the external grace that God has given them. And Augustine says no, because we are fallen and we are sinful and we are corrupt and everything that we do is tainted by sin. Pelagius and Julian of Eclanum at least say, I hear a Manichae talking. I hear a Manichae talking. You say you've left Manichaeanism, but apparently you haven't left it completely because you still have this idea, and I realize now that I haven't properly explained Manichaeanism so you can see the link, so let me, let me double back for a moment. The Manichae belief, the central myth of Manichaeanism was that at some point in the past, um, you know, not a historical point, but the beginning of the world or whatever, the, uh, the light, the pleroma, the divine essence, had been invaded by the kingdom of darkness, by the lower realm. And the darkness had taken much of the light hostage. And so you have the, you know, the darkness imprisoning the light. And the darkness is matter and the light is spirit. So this is why we have bodies imprisoning souls here in this world. Your body with the soul inside is darkness imprisoning light. And the goal of religion and the goal of all right-thinking men is to liberate that light and get it back to the Pleroma, get it back to God where it's supposed to go. And so in order to do this, you have to, uh, you have to negate the body. You have to live you know, ascetically, or at least support people who are living ascetically. Uh, the the Manichaeans, like some of the Gnostics, ended up dividing their communities into um, the leaders who would be the, the preachers and the leaders, and then the hearers. And the hearers were not expected to do all of the same things that the leaders were expected to do. But the leaders had to be celibate, for instance. You had to be celibate. You, you didn't want to, uh, you didn't want to uh, have children. Because if you're having children, you're just uh, imprisoning more light. Did the, the late Jesus, did he uh, uh, operate on his uh, body? that? Did he operate on, I don't understand the question. Well, didn't he castrate himself? Oh, I think you're thinking of Origen. There, there was that story about Origen, which we're not sure it's true or not, but I don't think Pelagius, I don't think Pelagius did. Um, but, uh, so uh, when Augustine was a Manichae, he was one of the Hearers. He was never one of the leaders because you know, he, was living with a, he was living with a concubine the whole time. Um, but he had this sort of aspiration that he was going to uh, be good and he never just got around to doing it, you know. But um, the sort of things, like to, he, one of the weird examples he gives is that the hearers of the Manichees were not allowed to eat melons. Because <coughs> melons were considered to be a, a luminous fruit. For some reason, melons were less less fleshly than other vegetables. Um, something about their shape, or I don't know, I don't know what the rationale behind it was, but there was, there was enough light trapped in a melon that you didn't want any hearers to eat it, because the hearers would eat it, and the light in the melon would accrue to their souls, and their souls are not necessarily going to be freed, because they are not pure. So the melons would be reserved for the eating of the, uh, of the pure, of the elect. The leaders of the congregation would eat the melons so that the light that was trapped in the melons could be freed through the ascension of their souls. Um, and so this is like the weirdness that you get when this, when this thing is made into a whole cosmology, that there's light and darkness and everything in different amounts, and you, know, you, know, like you order your life in such a way as to uh, try to help the light escape and go back to God. So uh, they end up being very negative on sex, at least in theory, um, because this imprisons more light. And it, it propagates the darkness. It propagates the kingdom of darkness, and it keeps it going. And if everybody was properly enlightened, there wouldn't be any. There wouldn't be any sex. People would just uh, look to heaven, and they would ascend, and it would be over. 
Uh, so when Augustine starts um, saying that the, the sinful flesh after the fall is wrecked so that it cannot be good before God and it cannot actually toe the line in the way Pelagius is insisting everybody needs to and you need the grace of God within you to be good, it's a pretty natural link, knowing that he used to be a Manichae, for Pelagius and Julian of Eclanum to say, you still got some Manichaeanism in there, bud. Especially in the discussion with Julian of Eclanum when he starts talking about the transmission of original sin and linking it to lust in the sexual act. You know, that, that's where even a lot of modern scholars think Augustine's got a little of Manichaeanism still, um, still uh, attached, still writing there. So um, that is why Manichaeanism, which isn't even Christian, Right, which is so far off the field that you know, it's obvious that that's the whirlpool. That's how that gets into this discussion as one of the poles. Um, human nature is evil. Human nature is good. There's Mani. There's Pelagius. Mani said a lot of other things, too, that wouldn't fit on any sort of a continuum of the Christian faith. But it's this particular doctrine because of this Pelagian controversy and the role that Augustine played in it and his Manichaean past. Human nature is evil, or at least, you know, the body is and the soul has to fight it. And therefore, you know, you can't, you can't be perfect, or maybe a few people can be perfect. It, it doesn't translate perfectly, but this is identified as the Manichaean element, and the Pelagian element is human nature is good. Everything God created is good. What's the problem? In the middle, human nature is fallen. And that is the orthodox course between Charybdis and Scylla. Human nature is fallen. It started out good, and there are still vestiges of good there, like we talked about last night. But in, uh, in practice, it's a broken machine, and it doesn't do any of the things it's supposed to. It does not image God, even though it has the vestiges. Right? You get Jack Nicholson instead of Michael Landon, like with my last... Uh, slide last night. You get, you get a father who takes an axe to his family instead of a father who's a good paragon of decency and paternal virtues. So there we go. There's classically, in the patristic understanding, that would be Scylla, that would be Charybdis. This is, you know, if you, if you say human nature is evil, that means the creator made an evil world. And that means the creator is not the father of Jesus Christ because the Father of Jesus Christ would not make an evil world. He is God, he is the source of all good. So you've got some kind of dualism that just destroys Christianity at the root if you say that human nature is just naturally evil. But over here, to say human nature is naturally good, well, that's a, that's a problem too. Maybe it's not gonna wreck the, the whole religion as, as much as if you become a manichae, but that's also a problem. That's also gonna kill people. But we're Lutherans, and we come much later, right? Uh, the Reformation is 16th century, and the whole Pelagian controversy happened at the end of the 4th century and the beginning of the 5th century. So there's more than 1,000 years. There's about 1,000 years separating the two. And the Lutherans reverse polarity. For Lutherans, this is Charybdis, and this is... Scylla. Why? Well, it's because we are not dealing with Manichaeanism. Manichaeanism was dead, uh, you know, by the end of, by the, well, by, well, maybe not the end of antiquity, but early in the Middle Ages, Manichaeanism was dead. The, the emperor Justinian outlawed it, well, Theodosius outlawed it, and uh, Justinian continued that, and uh, there weren't really any Manichaeans anymore, at least in the Christian world, uh, when you get a little ways into the, into the Middle Ages. There were groups like the Bogomils, and then in France in the 13th century, the Cathars, the Albigensians, who uh, had similar ideas and people suggested that there was some kind of subterranean link, that they were somehow a survival of Manichaeanism, but that's, you can't really prove that. So come to the time of the Reformation, and uh, this is the big issue, right? What is the doctrine, according to the Lutheran Reformation, what is the doctrine by which the church stands or falls? The doctrine of justification by faith alone. If you fail that, the, the church falls into the whirlpool. So this one doesn't get as much attention. Um, in, in the Reformation time, although 
as you will see, the Lutherans did correct for that back in the 16th century. Um, but it keeps coming back because in our day, we are even further away, or we're at least in the same place, you know, as they were in terms of this being the big danger, the big cultural danger, right? Living in America, people are like, well, I'm sure I'd make my own decision for God. Isn't this obvious? I'm not a robot. God doesn't, God doesn't turn my heart. So this is the thing that we end up fighting against mostly. And this is the, th so this is the place where we're going to steer, and that's the danger we're going to run into. Now here is, yeah, because they're weird. Nicholas of Lyra. Nicholas of Lyra is a um, Bible scholar, 13th century, 14th century. He wrote something called the Postilla, which is basically uh, footnotes, um, a running continuous commentary on the whole Bible, which was printed at the bottom of the page in the Bibles. Um, if you look at a Bible from Luther's day, you have the text right there. That's the actual scripture text on that page. And then you've got between the lines of the scripture te text, you've got commentary from various fathers. And then in all the margins, you have commentary from a bunch of different fathers, snippets from Augustine, Jerome, uh, you know, Irenaeus, Chrysostom, whoever, whoever the tradition had decided was especially illuminating on that verse. It, it was a study Bible. Um, and then, by Luther's time, at the bottom here, you had the postilla of Nicholas of Cusa. So when you read the Bible, you got Nicholas of Cusa. This is why Luther, if you read his, if you read his lectures on Genesis or his other class, you know, class lectures where he goes through the Bible and does exegetical stuff, he talks about Nicholas of Lyra a lot. Why? Because he was on every page. You know, he says, uh, Lyra has a particularly illuminating comment here, or I differ with Lyra here, or whatever. And Luther relied on Lyra a lot, and Luther mostly liked Lyra, but he could not have liked this. This is something I ran across when I was preparing a sermon. Um, the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown, and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I'm like, this is, a hard, this is a hard passage to understand. So I, I, I went to the ordinary gloss to see what the fathers had to say about it. And this is what Lear had to say about it. One of the things. He requires from a man, that is God, requires from a man, works deserving of eternal life. And yet he has not sown in the nature of man a principle sufficient for this work. So this is what it could mean. Man could say to God, how can you require this, uh, this perfection, this selfless charity from me as a precondition to get into heaven? You haven't given me that ability in my nature. You're, you're, you're reaping where you have not sown. For man is not able to merit eternal life purely by means of his natural endowments. Indeed, to say the opposite is the Pelagian heresy. Yet it is not unjust for God to require works deserving of eternal life, because if a man does what is in himself... Quad in se est. God pours on him the grace through which he can carry out the aforementioned work. I have now avoided Pelagianism. <laughs> you see? He is explicitly avoiding Pelagianism. He is explicitly says, we can't say that God gave man all the endowments of nature perfectly so that he can be perfectly good enough to get into heaven. He can be kind of good, but he can't be God good. He can't get into heaven. Um, to say that he did have that endowment by nature would be Pelagianism, and we don't want to be Pelagians. But if he's normal good, if he's garden variety good, then God will give him grace, and if he continues using that grace well, God will give him more grace, and eventually God will make him God good, you know, at the end of purgatory, and he'll be uh, worthy of heaven. And that is the semi-Pelagian soteriology that the Lutheran reformers were up against in their day, explicitly against Pelagius and yet smuggling him in by the back door, saying that the difference between why one man is saved and the other, and the other man isn't is because the one man uses his natural endowments better so as to attract more grace and so as to work with the grace better. And this is still basically the soteriological engine in Roman Catholic doctrine. So this is why Pelagianism becomes the Charybdis. This is why this becomes the maelstrom that the, that the whole church can fall into. Um, because, you know, 
uh, if, if you read the apology, Melanchthon goes on and on in uh, Article 4 about how, how is this different than the philosophers. You know, you, you, you are taking um, the second table of the law and all of this um, philosophical morality and wisdom and you're intruding it into soteriology so that grace, so salvation is not by grace anymore. Salvation is by how well you work with what is in you. Whatever that is, that's why you know, it's a great phrase. What is in you? Whatever it is. Whatever is in man. Let's not actually talk about that. But whatever it is, if God is just, he will honor it if you use that well. And the point that Lutherans make against this is nobody uses that well. Nobody uses that well because we don't have original righteousness anymore, which is what we were talking about last night. And then you get this guy, Matthias Flacius. Matthias Flacius, 16th century. Um, he overlaps with Luther's life here, you see. He's, um, he makes it to Wittenberg before Luther dies, and Luther's very impressed with his, uh, with his intelligence and with his promise. He becomes a Hebrew professor at Wittenberg in 1544, but then the Lutherans lose the war of the League of Augsburg. And, the, and they have to come to peace terms with the Holy Roman Emperor on, um, on grounds that are unfavorable to them. Like they are the losing side in the war. And so you get the Augsburg interim and then the Leipzig interim. And these are periods where the Lutherans, the Lutheran leaders, Melanchthon and the faculty at Wittenberg, make a compromise with the Roman Catholics and say, okay, well, we'll reintroduce um, certain practices. We'll reintroduce this liturgical element that we cut out or this liturgical element that we cut out. Um, we'll, stop, we'll stop hitting this point so hard. And they're trying to hold on to the essence of the Reformation um, and, but at the same time being forced to make concessions to the Romanists and trying to make the least damaging concessions and arguing that this is okay because these things that we're conceding on are adiaphora. These are not commanded by God, these things that we're conceding on. We can still preach the pure gospel, even if we're, you know, even if we're still doing the full canon of the Mass, which suggests that we are contributing to the sacrifice of Christ. And Flacius says, no. No, we can't. You teach things by what you do in the liturgy. You confess things by what you do in the liturgy. Um, it might be adiaphora in some instances, but when it's a time of confession, and there are links that can be drawn between your practice liturgically and uh, what you're confessing doctrinally, you can't compromise even something that would normally be an adiaphora. This becomes the adiaphoristic controversy, um, which is uh, pronounced upon in the Formula of Concord, I think it's Article 11. And Formula of Concord says Flacius was right. The Gnesio Lutherans, they were a party who became, that Gnesio means true, the true Lutherans, the ones who are keeping alive the spirit of Luther against the compromising of Philip, against the Philippists, the Philip Melanchthon uh, party. Um, so he has to leave Wittenberg, he goes to Magdeburg, and he writes unceasingly against the interims, and really turns public opinion, at least in northern Germany, completely against them. He said, it would be better to die. You put your life on the line, and, you, and you'd be willing to be put to death rather than compromise on anything with the papists. And uh, political events worked out in such a way that this, you know, that it became, that the interims were able to be discarded actually a little while later. But this controversy was through first and he, and he won. He was on the right side of this. He was also on the right side of another one against Philip, the, uh, the synergistic controversy where Philip started um, recognizing the will of man as one of the causes in human salvation. He says, you know, well, if you've got to explain why one person is saved and another person is not, sure, that's mostly the grace of God, but the will of man has got, has got to be a cause. It's got to be one of the moving causes in there. And uh, Flacius and uh, the Canisio Lutherans wrote against him on that point, too. And so he... Uh, He's a hero of the Lutheran, of Lutheran orthodoxy, one of the first heroes of Lutheran orthodoxy post-Luther. But he's mostly remembered for the Flacian error. Because in that controversy uh, about synergism, he ended up going too far. This is from uh, Bente's historical introduction to the Book of Concord. Following are some of the immoderate and extravagant statements made by Flacius. 
uh, and, and this isn't a controversy, the synergistic controversy, he is dealing with Victorin Striglin, among others. And Striglin is saying, uh, sure, man has fallen, but original sin is an accident. It's not part of the essence of man, it's an accident. You've got substance and you've got accident. And uh, the idea that this is, this is a whiteboard, okay? It's made out of, I don't know, whatever they make whiteboards out of, it's got substance. It could be a different color, right? You could make it black, and you got to have weird markers if you made it black, but you could make it beige, whatever. It doesn't have to be white. Whiteness is an accident. It's not part of the substance of the board. You could change the color of the board and it would, and substantially it would still be the same thing. So that's the, that's the concept of substance and accident. Uh, Aquinas, you know, in his theory of transubstantiation, which the, which the Roman church adopted, made use of this. He said the bread becomes, in substance, it really is the body of Christ. Metaphysically, it's not even bread anymore, but it has all the accidents of bread still. Um, it, all of the features that uh, allow us to interact with it in the physical world are still, are still those of bread. And so Strigelin was saying, it's, it's just an accident, right? It's a serious, it, it, it's a bad accident, but um, it's not of the essence of man, and therefore the will should still be able to do something um, in conversion. And Flacius said no. He said that God alone converts man, and the Adamic free will not only doesn't cooperate, but rages and roars against it. So like you become, a, you become a Christian, no, I don't want to become a Christian, no, I hate God, oh, I guess I'm a Christian. Okay, I love God now. <laughs> um, and the, uh, the formula of Concord in, in taking issue with this says, you know, man, man's not a stone, right? God doesn't pick him up and throw him. That's not how God acts on him. God acts through his will. God changes his will so that he is in fact willing, not of his own virtue, but he does come to faith willingly. And then it gets worse. Uh, the malice of our free will is a diabolical malice. By original sin, man is transformed into the image of Satan. Okay? And this really speaks to what we were saying last night about the image of God and man and to what extent it still survives. He said not only is the image of God gone, it's replaced by the image of the devil. By original sin, the substance of man is destroyed. After the fall, original sin is the substance of man. Man's nature is identical with sin. In conversion, a new substance is created by God. After Striegel, at the second session of the Disputation in Weimar, had declared that original sin was an accident which merely impeded free will and its activity, Flacius, in the heat of the controversy, exclaimed, Original sin is not an accident, for the scriptures call it flesh, the evil heart, etc. Striegel now was eager to entangle him still further, applying him with the question, Do you deny that original sin is an accident? Flacius answered, Luther expressly denies that it is an accident. Striegel says, do you mean to deny that sin is an accident? Flacius, I have said that scripture and Luther affirm that it is a substance. The sin is a substance. The sin is the substance of man after the fall. Why is this heretical to say? Formula of Concord, first article on original sin. If there were to be no difference whatever between the nature or essence of our body and soul, which is corrupted by original sin, and original sin, by which the nature is corrupted, it would follow either that God, because he is the creator of this, our nature, also created and made original sin, which accordingly would also be his work and creature, or because sin is a work of the devil, that Satan would be the creator of this, our nature. That's Manichaeanism. Right, um, he wasn't trying to be a Manichae, but that is a Manichaean conclusion that somebody other than God, the Father of Jesus Christ, must have made man. Because his essence is, you know, original sin. Substance comes only from God. Substance is defined philosophically as a self-existing thing. And then an accident is something that exists in a substance. Well, nothing actually is self-existing. Everything exists in God. God has to be the source of a substance if it is to be a substance. So either God is the source of evil, or there's another God. So you can get some creative powers. And then here's another one. If there were no distinction between the nature or essence of corrupt man and original sin, it must follow that Christ either did not assume our nature because he did not assume sin, like us in every way except sin, or that because he did assume our nature, he also assumed sin. Both of which ideas are contrary to the scriptures. 
But inasmuch as the Son of God assumed our nature and not original sin, it is clear from this fact that human nature, even since the fall and original sin, or that human nature, even since the fall and original sin, are not one and the same thing. But must be distinguished. If they couldn't be distinguished, then you couldn't distinguish them in Jesus Christ either. In the article of sanctification, Scripture testifies that God cleanses, washes, and sanctifies man from sin, and that Christ saves his people from their sins. So sin can't be man himself, for God receives man into grace for Christ's sake. But the sin, he remains hostile to eternity. Therefore, it is unchristian and horrible to hear that original sin is baptized in the name of the Holy Trinity, sanctified and saved, and other similar expressions found in the writings of the recent Manichaeans, with which we will not offend simple-minded people. Fourthly, in the article of the Resurrection, Scripture testifies that precisely the substance of this, our flesh, but without sin, will rise again. And that in eternal life you will have and retain precisely this soul, but without sin. So, you know, if they are corrupted by sin, if, the, if, if original sin is this gaping wound in our nature, then that can be healed, and our nature as, as it presently exists, our substance as it presently exists, can be healed and cleansed and glorified and live with God forever. But if our nature has actually turned into original sin, it can only be destroyed. Um, it, 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 or sin cannot be purified. Sin can only be destroyed. And we're back at the, we're back at the whirlpool with these conclusions. And uh, Flacius didn't intend to steer us back into the whirlpool. He thought he was going maybe toward the rock where Scylla was. You know, that maybe this would be a hard passage, but it's not going to destroy everything. But if you take the conclusions of what he said, it does destroy everything. You're right back at Manichaeanism. So the Benti quotation from before, he said that Scripture and Luther both supported him on this, in the saying that, that original sin is the essence of man after the fall. So he referred to Scripture passages where they talk about sin as flesh or uh, the stony heart, etc., which makes it sound like a substance. Um, you know, St. Paul in Romans 7, he talks about uh, the flesh waging war against the spirit. And... Um, so he's talking about the flesh, that, that is our substance, right? Our substance is the flesh, and he's talking about it as a completely evil thing. Nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. And so uh, flesh is considered this to be evidence of the scripture using flesh to mean original sin, and the spirit is the Holy Spirit. I, I expect he must have said the spirit is the Holy Spirit and not the spirit in man in that passage at all. And so uh, you get this flesh waging war against the spirit, and the, and the flesh is us. Therefore, we must be original sin in our essence. And this is why I remember once in college, uh, one, of my, one of my better professors, who also happened to be a, a Luther scholar, although he was, a, he was a Baptist, but he was a Luther scholar also. I remember him correcting one time in one of my papers, I talked about the sin nature. And he corrected it, sinful nature. And at the time I thought, well, you know, that's just him being a stickler for grammar. But it's not just him being a stickler for grammar. Sin nature, sinful nature. Sin is not a nature. Right? Sin is not a substance. It, it would have to be created by God in order to be a, an actual substance. But a nature can be sinful, can be full of sin, can be infected by sin. And so when he talks about the flesh, he is talking about a component of us. Right? And he's not saying that our body, like Paul is not saying that our body is evil and our soul is good, which is basically the Manichaean position, like the original Manichaean position right there. Romans 7, uh, this is a good Manichaean proof text, right? Paul's, uh, he, he's saying that we've got this body, which is bad, that's the darkness, and we've got this spirit, which wars against the body, that's the light that's trapped inside you. But what Paul is talking about is the mind set on flesh. When he, when he talks about the flesh waging war against the spirit, he means in your mind. Like you, uh, your mind wants to do the things of the flesh instead of the things of the spirit. Your mind, you know, you're, you're, you're drawn to the lusts of the body instead of controlling them with the, with the spirit that loves God and that knows what's right. And this is what Augustine said last night in that quotation in, the, in our presentation last night about how the penalty of the original sin 
and the penalty that we labor with now is that our flesh is disobedient to us in the same way that we were disobedient to God. Back when we were able to govern the flesh according to God's law, we chose not to. And now we can't govern the flesh even according to our own law. We say, stay alive forever. We say, thrive, be healthy, be happy. We go to the gym and we eat health food and then we still die of an aneurysm at 40. Um, we, we, we don't have control of the flesh anymore and so death is the, ultimate, you know, is the, pen, is the penalty for sin um, that is a poetic penalty, that we, we lose control of the flesh. And so when the flesh is talked about in Romans 7, it is the flesh um, as a governing principle. It is the mind set on flesh, which is the way Paul talks about it in the next chapter in, in Romans 8. It is the mind set on the flesh. Uh, the mind governed by the flesh, the lust of the body gov calling the shots instead of the law of God. And so it's not saying that we are just original sin, but that's how Flacius was reading it. And then uh, Luther, Luther said things like that sin was man's nature. He even said it was his essence in places, apparently. He talked about substantial sin, statements that, in retrospect, are dangerous statements, you know, and, and led Flacius astray. But if you take Luther in balance, he was not teaching the same thing that Flacius was. The palpable, palpable mistake of Flacius, Bentius says, was that he took the substantial terms on which he based his theory in their original and proper sense, while the Bible and Luther implied them in a figurative meaning, as the formula of Concord carefully explains in its first article, which is right here. Often the disposition or vicious quality of a thing is called its nature. As it is said, it is the nature of the serpent to bite and poison. Thus Luther says that sin and sinning are the disposition and nature of corrupt men. Therefore, original sin properly signifies the deep corruption of our nature as it is described in the Schmal called Articles. But sometimes the concrete person or the subject, that is, man himself with body and soul, in which sin is and inheres, is also comprised under this term for the reason that man is corrupted by sin, poison, and sinful. As when Luther says, thy birth, thy nature, and thy interior essence is sin. You know, which is something that he, that he shouldn't have said, but that's clearer after Flacius makes his mistake. That is sinful and unclean. Luther himself explains that by nature sin or person sin or essential sin, he means that not only the words, thoughts, and works are sin, but that the entire nature, person, and essence of man are altogether corrupted from the root by original sin. So back in the Pelagian controversy, this was, this was the original question. This was the big question on which Pelagius and Augustine's interaction um, circled. We have, okay, this is Augustine. I'm quoting Augustine, but Augustine is quoting Pelagius. So everything in italics is from something that Pelagius wrote against Augustine. Pelagius says, we have first of all to discuss the position which is maintained that our nature has been weakened and changed by sin. I think that before all other things, we have to inquire what sin is, some substance, or wholly a name without substance, whereby is expressed not a thing, not an existence, not some sort of a body, but the doing of a wrongful deed. I suppose that this is the case. And if so, how could it be that that which lacks all substance could possibly have weakened or changed human nature? So the implication here is that Augustine's a Manichaean. The implication here is that if he says that sin has changed our nature, and sin is just an action, sin is just doing something, how can doing something change our nature? Only a substance can redefine a substance. Augustine is saying that sin is a substance. He's saying that sin is created by God. He's saying that sin is, is the essence of the human nature after the fall. This is Pelagius' accusation here. Either Augustine is being philosophically incoherent, or this is what he's actually saying. And Augustine's response, since we've already learned that sin is not a substance, do we not consider, not to mention any other example, that not to eat is also not a substance? Because such abstinence is withdrawal from a substance inasmuch as food is a substance. To abstain then from food is not a substance, and yet the substance of our body, if it does altogether abstain from food, so languishes, is so impaired by broken health, is so exhausted of strength, so weakened and broken with very weariness, that even if it be in any way able to continue alive, it is hardly capable of being restored to the use of that food by abstaining from which it became so corrupted and injured. 
In the same way, sin is not a substance, but God is a substance, yea, the height of substance, and the only true sustenance of the reasonable creature. The consequence of departing from him by disobedience and of inability through infirmity to receive what one ought really to rejoice in, you hear from the psalmist when he says, My heart is smitten and withered like grass since I have forgotten to eat my bread. Which uh, you won't find the verse exactly that way in, in an English Bible. And he's uh, using the old Latin or possibly Jerome's translation at this point. Uh, but that's Psalm 102 or 104 um, that he's quoting there. So Augustine is saying, no, saying that it affects our nature does not mean that it's a substance. Because there are lots of things that affect natures that aren't substance. Stopping to eat will do a number on your nature. We'll do a number on your substance. We'll wreck your substance. We'll put you in the ground and make it decay. But it itself is not a substance. Well, abstaining from God, turning from God, losing the original righteousness, that's, you know, that's the same thing. So here's a slide from last night. Remember, we talked about uh, three reasons to say that the image of God has been lost. The third one was, if man believes that a functioning image remains, he may, rely on, he may rely on his powers to recommend himself to God and help to save himself. Now, this is basically what Flacius is concerned about, right? If we say that there's anything left in man that's good, if we say that there's any substance that was originally put there by the Creator, then man might cling to that, like Strigelin is doing right now, by saying, oh no, original sin is just an accident. I've still got some will. I can still cooperate with my salvation." If we just take away that, if we just take away the, the remnants of that image, if we just take away all the stuff that God put there in the first place, there will be no plank for Strigelin to cling to anymore. So that, this is uh, the concern of Flacius in this, in this controversy. And this is why he goes all the way and uses the most extreme language that he can and defends it to his death um, and ends up, Condemned in the formula of Concord, uh, not by name, but, um, you know, Article 2 and Article 11, he is the victor. But Article 1, he's one of the problems. Uh, because he's so, he's so worried that this doctrine might be misused that he just wants to get rid of it entirely. And he doesn't see that in steering so far away from what he thinks is the whirlpool, he's actually steering into another whirlpool. Or another way to put it, maybe, uh, Scylla... If you, sail past, if you sail by fast, she'll just take six men. But if you throw out the anchor and sit there, she'll make a buffet out of your ship. You know, and eventually it'll be just as bad as going into Charybdis. The formula of Concord takes Augustine's answer. Augustine, in many writings against the Manichaeans, in common with all true teachers, has, after due consideration and with earnestness, condemned and rejected the statement, original sin is man's nature or substance. After him, all the learned and intelligent also have always maintained that whatever does not exist by itself, nor is part of another self-existing essence, but exists subject to change in another thing, is not a substance, substantia, something self-existing, but an accidens, that is, an accident, something accidental. Accordingly, Augustine is accustomed constantly to speak in this way, original sin is not the nature itself, but an accidens vitium in natura, meaning an accidental defect or damage in the nature. And this is from Article 1 in the Solid Declaration of the Formula of Concord. But what kind of accident? We've got to deal also with Strigel in here, because he was also wrong. But if it be further asked what kind of an accident's original sin is, that is another question of which no philosopher, no papist, no sophist, yea, no human reason, however acute it may be, can give the right explanation. But all understanding and every explanation of it must be derived solely from the Holy Scriptures, which testify that original sin is an unspeakable evil and such an entire corruption of human nature that in it and all its internal and external powers nothing pure or good remains, but everything is entirely corrupt, so that on account of original sin, man is in God's sight truly spiritually dead." with all his powers dead to that which is good. So Strigelin's not going to be happy with that. You know, yes, original sin is an accident. We cannot say it as a substance. We will go into the, whirl the whirlpool of Manichaeanism if we say that. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's something left in man by, by, by which man can recommend himself to God. Quad in se, what is in himself? No. 
Uh, God does not base anything soteriologically on what man does with what is in himself. So you remember uh, Luther last night talking about, yeah, I've said the image of God is lost, but if someone wants to say that the image of God consists in reason and, you know, and dominion and things like that, let him at least acknowledge that this reason and dominion is entirely leprous. And that he's calling it the image of God the same way that we acknowledge that, you know, somebody consumed with leprosy is also still a human being. So, now we have this thing called radical Lutheranism. Uh, to bring it down to the present day, to bring it down to 20th and 21st century, I, I mentioned earlier how our context is very much like the context of the 16th century. Not so much because we're constantly waging war with the papists, although that's still there, that's always there in the background, um, but because of this American context where Doctrines, uh, you know, doctrines like uh, predestination, doctrines like uh, sovereign grace, the idea that uh, I have not, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, that we are powerless in our own, in our own flesh, in our own strength, um, that nothing in our nature recommends us to God, and it's all purely by grace, and he moves our will to love him. These are things that Americans hate. I mean, human beings hate them, but Americans especially do. Um, and so you get um, a strong impetus in confessional Lutheran circles. I mean, I'm not just talking Lutheran circles, I'm talking the best, the best parts of Lutheran circles, the ones that are most concerned with being Lutheran. A strong reaction against this semi-Pelagianism, or sometimes outright Pelagianism, really. Not that any, I don't know of any church body that actually has straight Pelagian doctrines anymore, um, but you can meet plenty of individuals who are just straight Pelagians. Um, so uh, it is uh, muscular Lutheranism, radical Lutheranism, to say no and take away all power from the human being and to talk like Flacius did. You know, the more, the more uh, radically you can state this, the stronger you make your point against all the semi-Pelagians that are surrounding you. And we have this. In radical Lutheranism, a term coined by Gerhard Ferdi. And Gerhard Ferdi is an exponent of this radical Lutheranism. Uh, this is from his book on being a theologian of the cross. Both of these are. This is a book that's recommended uh, routinely in confessional Lutheran circles. Uh, it's a commentary on Luther's Heidelberg Disputation, on the, the theological theses of Luther's Heidelberg Disputation. But he slips some stuff in there like this. So seductive has the exiled soul myth, right? Like he, is, he started out talking about the fall by pointing out that there was a myth of, of, of the soul falling into flesh. And one of the myths he has in mind, no doubt, is the Manichaean myth of the darkness taking the light captive, right? So seductive has the exiled soul myth been throughout history that the biblical story itself has been taken into captivity by it. The biblical story of the fall has tended to become a variation on the theme of the exiled soul. The unbiblical notion of a fall, see, see what he says there? The unbiblical notion of a fall has already included that. Adam, originally pure in soul, either by nature or by the added gift of grace, was tempted by baser lusts and fell, quotation marks, losing grace and drawing all his progeny with him into a mass of perdition. You know, he doesn't come right out and say it quite as clearly as, uh, as you know, as somebody who's really trying to defend Ferdy might um, say. You know, he's not actually saying that there. I've had this conversation. He's not actually saying that there. But he is saying that here, that the concept that Adam and Eve were created perfect and then fell, misused their freedom, misused the image of God and the righteousness and the free will that they'd been given to reject God and to injure their own natures. He's saying that is a myth, that is a pagan myth intruding on Christianity. That is, in fact, theology of glory, he says. Next quotation. The attempt to argue for at least a little bit of freedom in order to maintain human fault for the fall and sin is the telltale sign of a theologian of glory at work. If you say that Adam and Eve had free will and could have not fallen, you're a theologian of glory. 
according to Gerhard Ferdi. And if you have read anything or heard anything about theologian, the theology of glory, you know that's a bad thing, right? Lutherans are supposed to be theologians of the cross, of the suffering of God in the human flesh and the ways of God being hidden from us in weakness. Uh, and any sort of, uh, basically he's saying that it's not good enough to say, I, a poor miserable sinner, have no strength and no ability to come to God on my own. The Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel. It's not enough to say that about ourselves now. We have to say that about Adam and Eve, too. We have to say that about all human beings, always and ever. But you know what that means? That means God is the author of evil. That means God is the author of sin. Adam and Eve didn't fall. Not because they're not sinful now. Ferdy is very plain that they're sinful now, and this is why confessional Lutherans like him, right? He, he really drives that home. We are sinful now. We are lost without God. He just throws that in the, in the face of modern American liberalism and everything else. But there was no fall because that's how man's always been. God did not make man any better than that. And part of the reason you know, he says this is because he, uh, he's letting the theory of evolution influence his theology. Um, you know, man obviously came from the apes. The apes don't have a moral code. They don't have a moral sense. They don't know God. So that's why sometimes he, in other books he talks about the fall being a fall up. The ape became sentient, realized, it's re realized uh, that it had a creator and that it had obligations to its creator and that it couldn't meet them. So that was the fall, realizing that it was condemned before God. But it was a fall up in the sense that if he had stayed an ape, he never, if he had stayed an ape, he never would have had that realization in the first place. He actually became more complex in order to have that realization. He became closer to God in order to be alienated from God. And then here's uh, Stephen Paulson, who is a student of Ferdy, who is still living and teaching at uh, Luther Seminary in Minnesota, which, from what I hear, is probably the best of the Elka seminaries for what that's worth. Um, but he's, he's very, uh, he's very, he's sort of on the outs with, with the ELCA, and that's one reason why confessional Lutherans tend to like him, because he's got this bad boy fighting from inside image. But he reproduces this from Ferdy. The legal scheme, which is his, his code in his book Lutheran Theology for uh, basically a theology of glory, understanding the world according to law and something that humans can manipulate. Oops. The legal scheme assumes that it knows what death is because it imagines that the free will once stood as master of sin, able to sin and able not to sin. Passe peccare, passe non peccare. That's straight out of Augustine from the Pelagian controversy at its own discretion. So he is denying the fall also, because, not because we're not sinful now, but because we were never any better. We never had a place to come from. And now this is, uh, this is a paragraph of my own from a review that I did for the uh, AAR journal, volume two, if you want to read the whole thing. Um, Paulson interprets the communicatio idiomatum, that is, in the two natures of Christ, when the two natures of Christ are joined in a hypostatic union, um, the natures share each other's idioms. The natures share each other's traits, characteristics, names, etc. He interprets this not as God the Son sharing in human nature, but sharing in human sin. He interprets the patristic dictum, what was not assumed cannot be healed, in the same willfully twisted way. What Christ assumes from sinners is their sin. What was not assumed cannot be healed was said against Apollinaris and people like Apollinaris who said that God, that Jesus didn't become fully human. Apollinaris said that Jesus was, that the soul of the man Jesus Christ was replaced. The human soul that he normally would have had was replaced by the divine logos and the divine logos took over all the soul functions within him. And the orthodox answer to that is he wasn't really a man then. He was not one of us. Uh, how, could he, how could he die for us? How could he save human nature if he himself was not a man? This is the whole reason he became a man in the first place, so he could be like us and die for us and save us. Um, if he did not assume our souls, then our souls are not healed. Like he healed my body. Well, that's great, but my soul is still guilty as hell. Right? And my body can be immortal now. Well, that's great, but, um, but my soul is still damned. So uh, no salvation. That's what it means um, but Paulson, Paulson quotes it as if it meant this. 
um, that he took, he went so deep into humanity that he shared in our sin also. Um, and this is flation. This is more flation than flation, right? I mean, like, flacious, flacious uh, bungled into it and um, stuck to it because he was stubborn, right? But Paulson should know better. You know, he's got the formula of Concord. He's got all the, the, the centuries since then. He's got his eyes open on this, um, and he takes it further. He takes it further that um, Christ becomes sin, right? He made him to be sin who knew no sin. He, he says, you know, that, that's, the, that's the incarnation. He became sin. He became, you know, he, he confuses the essence of man with original sin, just like Flacius did, but he takes it further. You know, I don't want my sin to be healed. What Christ assumes from sinners is their sin. He assumes it so it can be healed. I don't want my sin to be healed. I want to be healed of my sin. Sin just has to die. Sin can't be healed. As long as sin suggests, exists, I am sick and I am dying. He rejects the definition of chalcedon also, and this is the, uh, the I mean, since the fifth century, the Catholic and Orthodox and the Lutherans accepted it too, um, understanding of the two natures of Christ. He rejects that. He says, incarnation does not mean that human nature was added to divine nature or that Christ assumes humanity as a category. Well, that is what it means. You know, that's what it says. And that's what the Lutheran confessions, and Luther too, say also. Um, it's just that uh, he doesn't like all these essentialist categories. He doesn't like this philosophical language, or at least if it's, if it's the kind of philosophical language that the fathers and the Lutheran theologians use, he doesn't like it. He's more influenced by existential modern, modern philosophy. And so he thinks that he has a real incarnation of Christ as long as Christ somehow takes our sin, shares our sin, and he would defend himself against this claim that he is some kind of a neo-Manichaean, probably by saying, I don't believe in essence and substance in the first place. You know, this is, this is all about what you do. It's all about act. But um, I'm not nearly enough of an existentialist to even understand how that's a defense, let alone agree with it. So, yeah, wait, wait a sec. I'm almost, I'm almost done here. So in summary... Formula of Concord, Article 1, this doctrine must be so maintained, that is about original sin, and guarded that it may not deflect either to the Pelagian or the Manichaean side. Okay, this is the path between Scylla and Charybdis. Um, and which one is Scylla and which one is Charybdis? The answer is, whichever one you're steering towards, because you think it's safer, you're, you're treating it like Scylla, right? But if you actually go to either place, they're both whirlpools. There is no safer path. Um, the one you're steering away from is just the one that you know is a whirlpool. And you, you, have, to try to, you have to try to walk that, uh, that tightrope. And, um, you know, people do get snatched by Scylla, so the, the, the metaphor really uh, holds. But you, you're, trying, you're trying to stop that from happening. You're trying to do a balanced, responsible theology. And we have a few minutes for questions. Yeah, in, in the uh, Council of Chalcedon, uh, crisis was defined in negative terms. Uh-huh. Yeah. We, which that, that, you don't confuse it. Yeah. Two natures, you know. The, the uh, divine... Without division, without separation, without confusion, without change. We still uphold that in terms of that, that if we go outside this, that definition of negativism, definition of who Christ is, then we go into heresies. Yeah, what, what you're able to affirm positively is that there are two natures, so he is equally God and man, but there's just one person. Right. And... Uh, and that those negatives are put in there to clarify what is meant by that and to stop people from coming to conclusions, synthetic conclusions that are false, either on the uh, side of Nestorianism or the side of Eutychianism. Right. And, yeah, so if somebody is, like, explicitly denying the Council of Chalcedon, that's a danger sign. Okay. Um, just... Yeah. Yes? So Paulson denies the Athanasian Creed. The divine assumed the human nature into itself. 
Yeah, he would, ha I, he would have to say, you know, I, I, affirm, I affirm that once I've gotten to redefine the terms. <laughs> you know, if, if I get to redefine the terms, that's, that's substantialist language. And uh, I reject substantialist language, and so I'm going to have to redefine the terms. But in my own way, I still affirm that, I'm, I'm, he would probably say. Although he does, not, he does not ascribe to the formula of Concord. He's not like, he probably ascribes to the Athanasian Creed in some sense, but I don't think he even tries to ascribe to the formula of Concord. But Christ would not become, become humanity because he would be become sin. The Son of God would not take on humanity. Because he's, he's Galatian, false. Uh, well, he sees what, what, what it means for the Son of God to take on humanity, since, since the human race is intrinsically flawed, like there was no fall, it, it's, always, it's always been this way, it's always uh, needed the grace of God to do everything for it, or else it blunders around in sin pitifully all the time. Um, he has to have that experience of being weak and being subject to sin, etc., in order to be truly human is what he ends up saying. Both of them are, uh, Ford, Ferde and Paulson are trying to deal with process theology controlled by evolutionary theory. Of the God, the evil, mm -hmm. the God, God created. Yeah, well that is, yeah, that is part of the original creation, yeah. Um, you know, probably because of how God chose to create um, through, through evolution. Now, you know, you, this is, not a necessary, this is not a necessary component of theistic evolution. You can say, you can hold a theistic evolutionary position and say, but, but then God made him a man, and God gave him a soul, and God gave him the image of God, and God gave him divine freedom and all of this, um, but he doesn't do that. You know, he, he, uh, lets, he lets evolution influence his theology instead of the other way around. So in effect, in effect Christ assumes our nature but the nature that was like Adam's before the fall. Um, is that right, or am I wrong? Well, he doesn't distinguish between them. Like, it, it's, it's the same nature. That's, that's the point. That's why there's really no fall, because the nature that we have now is the same nature that Adam had before the first sin, which he sometimes calls the fall, but it's not really a fall to him. Okay. Yes? But Christ did not have, and could not, Sin. Yeah, well, that's what Christians say. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so one of the items I had of you, Christian from Africa, he says, how could he be human then if he could not sin? You know. And, yeah. Uh, well, that you know, that's that's the process. That's part of the process of the thought that goes that leads to error here. You, you have to say that because he was a human. In that he was human, he was capable of sinning. In that he was God, he was not capable of sinning. How does this work out in the unified person? Well, the unified person took on that extra nature so that he could work our salvation. If he were to sin and violate his divine nature, if that were even possible, it would totally wreck the whole purpose why he took the human nature in the first place. So obviously he's going to act according to the divine nature in that case, not according to the potentiality of the human nature. And yeah, that's, that's what you have to say to that. He was God after all, but he took on our nature. And uh, was it, at the, the times he was temp tempted by the devil, he was not going to sin because the divine nature was there. He was in that way. Yeah. He got to live by every word of God, and he did live by every word that came out of God. Yeah, when, when, you, when you look at Christ being, you know, if, if you were to see Jesus Christ being tempted by the devil, he would say, well, that's a man. He can sin. Even if he's got all of the original innocence that Adam had, he can sin. But when you see him in the eyes of faith, you say, that's God. God can't sin. Yeah. That was his defense. I mean, so he wasn't just a man, and then God came into him. No, he was God and took on human flesh. Mm -hmm. And... Um, that's, that's, that was the whole secret of the whole thing. Against the devil. Oh, this is just a man. The devil no, he's not just a man. He's God incarnate. Yeah. And with Ferdy, uh, what Paulson ends up having to try to do is explain, you know, how, how Jesus 
can sin without sinning. <laughs> uh, you know, the, he interprets the cry of dereliction as, as uh, you know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He actually interprets that as uh, a, a lack of faith. Yeah, it says Jesus' own personal sin. Yeah, he calls it, he, he says he committed his own personal sin. He suffered as we suffer, but without sin. But then a few pages later he says, of course he didn't sin. So <laughs> he's, trying to, he's trying to have it both ways. Um, and really? Well, he was, uh, the presiding pastor of the AALC confronted him on that. Yeah, okay. And uh, after quite a bit of discussion, Paulson said, yeah, I shouldn't have said that. Oh, that's good. So, so he kind of recanted, but I don't, I don't know if he's done that. Before. Well, I want to see what he has, writes about it in the future. Yeah, I, because I think the fact that he did say that just like, shows you that he actually is flation, like more flation than flacious was, think, or else he wouldn't have blundered into that. So he's got, he's got more to retract than just that. I think so, too. But I think a lot of the, in my opinion, a lot of guys like Paulson and Curdy, they, they just like to use this really extreme kind of shocking language. Radical Lutheranism. So I don't yeah. think they really even understand the implications Shock. of Shock! Lutheranism. I'm not what you expect. It's not, it's I break all your categories. Not Sorry. Out their argument and find out what the natural conclusion yeah, our, see, our theology, destroys everything. The, the whole Lutheran scholastic tradition is so careful with the way it uses terms. Mm -hmm. Everything has a very precise definition. And uh, I think when you get away from that, you end up saying things that you're not meaning to say. Exactly. And you yeah. fall into, even if, if, like when Paulson was confronted, he's like, oh, I didn't really mean to say that Jesus sinned. But that's exactly what he said. Yeah. So, if you're not using these careful categories, you are going to fall into some kind of area like that. <coughs> but he doesn't realize he's talking about God himself. God can't sin. Now, the question is that, go to the very basics in terms of saying, who died on the cross? Yeah. Okay. Well, he would, say, he would say God died on the cross. I mean, he wouldn't have any problem with that. Um, it's... He's, he's trying to walk, he's trying to walk like a tightrope that doesn't exist. He's trying to levitate. But, but can you read the quiet, you know, you know, in terms of our human mind to understand fully you know, all of those things, you know? Well, no. But you can define it well enough to make the distinction between original sin and, and uh, well, and the image of God, like we talked about last night, uh, or between original sin and... Uh, and the creature, right? We are still creatures of God. We have not been converted into original sin. We are still creatures of God. We are wounded. We have a gaping hole. Us. Original sin is an accident. Uh, and, and, and it needs to be healed. I like the term corrupted. Yeah. Yeah, corrupted is perfect because corruption, corruption is not... Yeah. Because if you think about a tooth, think about a tooth with a lot of cavities. Right? What is the cavity substantially? Corruption. Yeah, it, it, it is a corruption, but could you like take some corruption out of the cavity and say, hey, look, here I have some corruption that I got from a cavity? A hole. It's a hole. Exactly. It is a hole where something good what? that's rather important isn't anymore. Right. You know, and that's what corruption is. Corruption is an absence of something that should be there, and uh, it's not its own substance. If it were its own substance, you'd have to explain why did God make it. Just like the definition of evil, right? Which cannot exist from the good itself. Yeah. I mean, it, it has to be a negation of. It's a corruption of. Right. Good. That's right. That's right. You know, so it is spoiled good. Right. If I may quote St. C. Well, he said it's spoiled good. Because there's good. Do you have a question? or? No, I was just going to suggest if there are more questions, uh, feel free. We, we need a few more minutes for. Uh, some things to mature. Okay, so we have a few more, a few, a few more minutes to run over. But mature is the opposite. <laughs> but but you know, in in terms, in one of the Bible classes, uh, we were defining evil and trying to come up with a definition, and and that is, we came up with a top level definition, which is basically um, negating the character of God. Okay. So mm -hmm. define what is the character of God, you know, righteousness, unrighteousness, you know, yeah. you know holiness, unholiness, 
etc. Down, down the line, though. Yeah, that's what we talked about last night. The image of God, original righteousness, all these good things that God put into you, which you, uh, which you have lost and which you act the contrary. You end up doing the opposite things to what God made you to do. Question. It's not really a question, just as a point of order. If you have a question or a comment, could you come to the microphone? This is being recorded and it helps with the recording. Okay, yeah. And it's also good for order in the, in the asking of questions and all that. So please, uh, if you have a comment, comment, a question, statement, please come to the microphone to make that. that we, we might be out of uh, questions and comments by now. <laughs> all right, not quite out. Yes. Well, yeah, with reference to um, uh, last night's um, discussion, I mean, the um, Roman Catholic side of the natural law and the image, you, you see C.S. Lewis as the example, uh, really strong view of it. Um, would you see that as tying more in with uh, Pelagianism and uh, um. your view of the Law written on our hearts, with. That's the side, side where it will err, right? Like, that's, if, if it's going to go wrong, that's how it's going to go wrong. Uh, anytime you talk about the image of God as something still existing, um, when you, you talk about the vestiges of, the, of uh, a man's original perfection as the image of God, as vestiges of the image of God, uh, you're talking about the good that's still left in man. And so if you don't balance that out with a, the, the kind of description we got in the formula of Concord of what does this accident of original sin look like, you know, it's, it's a gaping wound, it's a thorough leprosy, you know, it's like uh, it's a cancer, you're, you're, you've got cancer everywhere. Um, you know, that, that's what it looks like. It's, you, you still are the creature of God, but you're not the way God made him to be. And if you're taken as a package, you're not the image of God anymore because you don't look anything like him. You know, although you still have these vestiges that are left over from the original image. And if you don't balance it out with that kind of a careful qualification, then yeah, it naturally goes in a semi-Pelagian order direction where you start speculating about, well, whatever is still in us, the quad in the say, whatever still is in himself, um, if he is more responsible with that than somebody else is, God may take notice and say, okay, I'm going to send my grace to that guy right there because he's been responsible with a little bit that he did have. And I'm going to allow him, you know, I'm going to allow him to be saved because he was better than his neighbor. And then you, you, end, you end up with what we got, you know, from that Nicholas of Lyra quotation, that kind of semi-Pelagianism. Now, the radical Lutherans, are they influenced, you think, by Barth at all? Or did they, they just skip over him and go right back to Everybody is influenced by Barth. Um, do you have a thought on that, Jordan? Yeah, I mean, the, the radical Lutherans are influenced largely by uh, someone like Warner Ehlert, mm -hmm. uh, somewhat by someone like Gustav Lindgren. And uh, they, those, those two figures are both opponents of Barth in a lot of ways. And, and uh, they're actually, I think, at their best when they're confronting Barth. <laughs> um, but at the same time, they're influenced by the kind of existential ideas that, that influence Barth. So, so there's, there's kind of an interesting relationship there uh, where they're taking some from Barth in terms of his existential um, ideas, but they're rejecting, you know, for example, his formulation of law and gospel, where he says law follows gospel, or where he says that there's one word of God, which is law and gospel, uh, these, these kinds of things. Um, but, but I don't think they, when they're reacting against Barth, I think they still use a lot of his presuppositions. Um, so, so I think that that existential kind of mode of doing theology is, is in Ferdy and, uh, and in Paulson. And, and uh, you know, Beyer, for example, Oswald Beyer is kind of that same, part of the same school of thought, um, but much more careful. I think. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, if you're going to read any of these guys, read, read Beyer because he's a, he's a good scholar and he's very careful in what he says. Um, so he's kind of an intellect behind this movement, I guess. And, and uh, Beyer, he, he says, blatantly, he says, look, the existentialists, were right, you know, Boltmann was right uh, in saying that it's really all about this event where we're encountering God existentially, which is what, you know, what Barth says. Uh, but just what they did with it is wrong. So he kind of says we take that framework and then put Lutheran ideas into it. Yeah. Do we get a degree 
this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's an awful lot of uh, existential thought that went into 20th century Lutheran scholarship. And, you know, when, when in Ferdy, in On Being a Theologian of the Cross, he ends up saying, like, any philosophical attempt to understand anything about God from nature is theology of glory. Um, you know, Luther definitely said if you try to make yourself right with God that way, it's theology of glory. If you try to uh, overrule revelation that way, that's theology of glory. But um, Ferdy said just the whole project of natural theology, and, and this, I guess, would be a way in which he's like Bart. Yeah, we're very similar to Bart. Yeah. And uh, that school of thought, they also, it's not just they say we can't talk about the essence of God, but they specifically reject things like divine simplicity. Um, they, they reject just the traditional ideas of who God is in Christian theology. So, uh, so Oswald Bayer, for example, says God contradicts himself. Uh, he says that quite a few different times. It, 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 have, it, it's a weird interpretation of the hidden and revealed God, the dialectic in Luther and the bunch of the will, where basically the hidden God is the God of law, the revealed God is the God of gospel, and they kind of contradict each other. So God's really contradicting himself in law and gospel. They're contradictory words. All the way around, right? With hidden and revealed? Yeah, did I say it backwards? Yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean. Um, so, so but, but they are rejecting a traditional doctrine of God. So, of course, that gets to the question of how do you affirm the creed? Well, I guess it depends which direction you approach it from. Sorry, go on. Uh, but, it, you know, it gets to the question of how do you affirm the creeds. Uh, so, but, but they're not simply separating themselves from certain movements in Lutheran scholasticism. They're kind of saying Christian theology has gotten all this wrong from the beginning. Right. Which is one thing that makes it radical Lutheranism. It's like, uh, in a lot of ways, they're starting Christ the Christian theology over again with Luther and, exactly. for and pretending that the fathers aren't there. And, and that's what, when Paulson references the fathers of Greek Lutheran theology, like you brought up the, the quote where it says basically, well, they were wrong, saying he just, you know, what was not assumed could not be redeemed. We have to change that phrase. I mean, almost any reference you find to the church fathers is a negative one. Uh -huh. or, or completely repurposed, so it's yeah. being twisted. And this, this rejection of philosophy that you get, you know, um, as, as theology of glory just dovetails with uh, existentialism because existentialism rejects all the philosophy that came before. And so as long as, because you're an existentialist, you want to get rid of all these essential categories like substance and essence and, um, you know, things, things, having, uh, things having a substance that you have to nail down before you can talk about what they do. You know, let's just talk about the encounter with God. Let's just talk about what they do. That's what the existentialists want to do. Well, it's also, it's also what Ferdy, you know, Ferdy reads all of this theological, all of this natural theology enterprise trying to discover anything about God whatsoever by means of philosophy. He's perfectly happy to ditch all these all this philosophy and natural theology of the past because it's done in the essentialist categories. And so the, the existentialism of the modern times dovetails perfectly with, uh, that's why he reads Luther that way in that book. Yes? R.C. Sproul uses Luther 10 times more than Calvin. <laughs> what is he? Well, he's a Calvinist. <laughs> He just thinks Luther was a Calvinist, too. <laughs> but he quotes Luther all the time. A, a lot of Calvinists quote Luther. Is that right? They do. They'll even hand out the bondage of the will. Yeah, they, they think bondage of the will is basically the will greatest nature. <laughs> used to be a well, and the, and the radical Lutherans love bondage of the will, too. Like, in, a, in the first chapter of... Oh, they of, were talking about hardening Pharaoh's heart because of yeah. God kind of creating evil. That's this contradictory aspects of God. Kind of thing. Right. In the first chapter of that Lutheran theology book, um, Paulson says it was his best, you know, his best work, um, Bondage of the Will. And, you know, some, and some of the things that Luther says in Bondage of the Will, you know, some of the arguments that he makes in Bondage of the Will, um, they do lead to this kind of thinking, actually. You know, like uh, some of the things he says about um, all things happening by necessity, and or the, original, the original statement that he's defending that Erasmus had attacked was all things happen by absolute necessity, which actually is a Manichaean statement if you take it out to its extremes. So. And interestingly enough, Calvin actually in the Institutes rejects that phrase. <laughs> so uh, in some ways, some of Luther's statements even goes farther than Calvin does. Yeah. When he's not being careful. Did Luther actually say that the bondage of will okay, mm -hmm. was his best writing? 
Uh, he said, yeah, he said at some point that it was one of the ones he liked the best and that he would want to survive even if everything else was lost. And the small catechism. And the small catechism, right. Um, the formula of Concord uh, mentions the bondage of the will positively in, um, you know, when talking about, the, uh, about free will. Uh, and sometimes this, you know, people point to this and say, look, the bondage of the will has been given quasi-confessional status by its mention in the formula of Concord. But if you look at that carefully, um, they, talk about, they talk about bondage of the will, and then they talk about the lectures in Genesis. And at the end, they say, in that work, he has uh, very carefully dealt with all questions result, you know, dealing with absolute necessity and related questions. The work they're talking about is not bondage of the will. The work they're talking about is the lectures in Genesis, which Chemnitz considered to have corrected Luther's excesses in bondage of the will. Uh, in, in looking at that, I took a course in philosophy. And lo and behold, the whole issue of free will was discussed. Mm -hmm. And about, I'd say about 80 more, maybe even more, percent of all the philosophers basically said, hey, there is no free will. They defined it in about 10 different terms. But uh, I was kind of shocked that in the American population, mm -hmm. They all have a free will. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you look at it and say to somebody, a citizen, you don't have a totally free will, they think you're crazy. Right. That's your American, American. That's American Christianity. Like yeah. Well, at least until you have some kind of an addiction or some kind of area, you're a victim, and then you're like, oh, I don't have any free will, I'm a victim. We're out of time, yeah. aren't we?